Hey guys, welcome to part two of our epic rotary road trip. As you can tell, we made it to LA, but not without issues. There was this big boom this morning, and now there's a fire department on the street in front of our place here. And downtown LA is closed off, and we have to be in Mazda Tommy in less than two hours, dude. It's gonna take us at least an hour and a half to get there. Welcome to life in the big city. I'm hoping we can get there and tour the historic collection and go for a ride with Dave. Let's uh, hit the road, dude. Hey. All right, Tommy, I'm super excited to uh, finally get over to Mazda's headquarters here in California. Uh, look at the car, it's just so charming. I mean, pristine, almost pristine, 50,000 mile car. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hey, you're gonna go left uh, go when you lane. can, yep. People really guard their lanes here in California. I've always found that to be uh, an interesting quirk of uh, Los Angeles. You are on the fastest route despite some traffic. You will arrive at 829. I think we have to wash this car too, Dad. Yeah, it's pretty dirty. I mean, almost a thousand miles of road grime on it is not good so we have to be at Mazda at 9 Google says we'll get there 8.30 8.30 it'll give us a half hour to find a car wash you know Tom this is a really great little city car not only is it small and nimble so you can kind of dart in and out of traffic when you need to but these 13s that's right we're rolling on 13s they have tall sidewalls which means that these potholes and manhole covers don't really bother the car tall sidewalls help the uh, suspension just soak up these bumps really good in the city and gotta love it manual transmission yeah and stop and go traffic it's no good but when you're doing this kind of city driving it gives you a lot more control you know when we had this in Colorado it was a little on the uh, well shall we say slow side but this Ford barrel at sea level it just brings this car to life and this rotor engine just hums look at it go Coming up on the 405. Once again, any highway where you can divide the number by five is trouble in LA. What does that say, Tommy? Death before Prius. That is a man who likes his heavy duty truck. Death before Prius. They route 55 north for a half mile. Here we go into the car wash, you're good. Okay, we gotta wash this car before we show it to Mazda, don't we? Yep, for sure. It's got like almost a thousand miles of road dirt on it. Guy's yeah, super excited, man. Tyler there. He's ready. Gold wash. Here we go. Now it's time to vacuum out the little Mazda. Pringles, Tommy. Yeah, it looks good. We made it, Tommy. Long drive. Long drive, but here's Mazda. First of all, thank you very much. You're welcome. For, Most definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for giving us this opportunity to kind of walk through these classic cars. And tell me a little about the collection before we open and show them. Sure. We have at any given time between 50 and 70 cars down here. Historic cars, concept cars, uh, race cars of different significance uh, to Mazda at, in North America. Obviously, they have a museum in Hiroshima, and they also have one over in Frankfurt. This is not what we would call a museum in the traditional sense. This is a working garage where we maintain these cars, and our goal is really to 
actively celebrate the history of these cars by continuing to drive them. You know, and I love that because I always look at car museums as kind of a hospice for cars, right? It's, yeah. It's where they go to die because a car has to be driven. That's why I like driving this RX-7 here was so cool, right? You could actually see the car come back to life when you're driving it. And so I'm super excited that you guys not just, you know, collect them, but that you drive them. Here, Open it up, man. Oh gosh. Okay, well, here's a secret key right here. So they're all motion sensors, so you kind of have to do this a Oh, bit. there we go. We always love to do a top 10 list. So mm -hmm. There are about 50 cars here. How long would it take us to go through this whole garage? Okay, so I've been told that, uh, I'm full of hot air on this, but I've been told that, that I can do this tour in about an hour and a half to two hours without taking a breath. Okay, all right, <laughs> let's do this. Let's do the top 10 cars in the collection because an hour and a half is probably a little bit more than we can even edit. But over to our left is the number one car. I'm just teasing it, yeah. so we won't show it but let's skip the number one car and let's go to number 10. Okay, right. number 10. All right, let's start with the 929. Okay, so where is the... No, you're gonna find the 929. Yeah, where is the 929? I know it's down here somewhere. There it is, right way in the back. Oh, it is super clean, dude. Yeah. You know, um, this car has a lot of infinity in it. Yeah. Right? I mean, I mean, at that time, Infiniti and Mazda and Nissan were kind of competing. So what we'd probably say is this came from what they call the bubble era in Japan, in Japan, which is where they were flush with money. They were coming out with all these new designs. This chassis right here, the rear wheel drive chassis for the 929, underpinned two cars, the 929 and the Yunus Cosmo, which we have one over there, which is a three rotor twin turbo luxury car. Uh, this car right here was, it did compete with, with your Infinities and your Lexuses and, and your Acuras of the day. And it was, in today's money, this would be a $50,000, $60,000 car adjusted for inflation. And this one in particular is a 1992 929. And, um, one of the cool things about it is this was an ad shoot car, we believe. And why I say that is because the badge on the front of it has a has the rectangle badge, which was only used for two model years on two cars. Then after that, uh, it went to a little bit more of a rounded shape uh, due to uh, liability concerns from the legal department. It is the smoothest thing in the world. So number nine is actually not even a car, it's a truck. It's, so it's a repu. Tell me about the rotary pickup. Okay, so the Ripu was only sold in Canada and the US. There were 14,000 of them made. This one, I believe, is in 1975. And it was based on the B-Series pickup truck. And where uh, Ford, which uh, had some stake at Mazda at the time, uh, sold the, the, the B-Series as a captive import called the Ford Courier, Mazda had sold this version, the B-Series, uh, both in the U.S. as the B-Series, but then there was a high-performance sports truck version, and it was a rotary truck, uh, rotary engine pickup, or repu. So this one is actually not completely stock. It has a racing beat intake, a racing beat exhaust. Uh, it has a five-speed out of an RX-7, and it is probably one of the louder cars down here. Back in the 1970s, uh, sports trucks were becoming a thing with this, with the, the Dodge Little Red pickup. Uh, things like that, and but this was certainly a very, very, very different take on how to build a, uh, a pickup truck, and and uh, now they're they're really, really collectible. Look there. It says a Canon uh, Canon air filter has a racing beat catback. Um, I believe this. Yeah, this has a catalytic converter. Uh, catback exhaust. It's not hugely more powerful than the stock one, which made about 100, 110, 120 horsepower, but it has enough get out of go, get up and go, especially with that five speed that it's, it's a hoot. We've taken this thing on 200 mile road trips before. It's a champ. All right, well, let's walk over here to number eight. Number eight is actually a bunch of cars. It's not just one car. It's uh, the first, second, and third generation RX-7. So we've got the car that we brought you, but this is a GS. LSE, which had the 13B fuel-injected rotary engine. Of course, this is the next car 
the next gen, the second gen, and then of course there is the one that everybody lusts after, uh, the twin turbo. Yeah, most definitely. So this one uh, makes about 35 horsepower more than the car that, that you brought. Uh, this car was owned by a dealer in, in Alaska who never drove it and because the roads were so, so bad. And we uh, ended up getting a call a few years ago and they said, hey, would you guys like to buy it? I had about 1,100 miles on it at the time and now it has a little under double that. Um, it is a GSL SE, which means it is completely loaded, top of the line. Uh, the sunroof, the, uh, the fuel injected 13B, uh, makes about 135 horsepower, and it's really a joy to drive. This uh, kind of burgundy leather, it's a time capsule. <laughs> Almost definitely. There it is. There's the fuel injector. And it's about the same size as a 12A. Yeah. All right, so tell us about the next one. Okay, so this one's a 1988. It's a Turbo 2, which was only made uh, for a couple of model years. And this is a 10th anniversary edition. And it has a 182 horsepower engine. Again, like the GSL SE right next to it, it's a top of the line model. Uh, this one uh, has the, the, the works, the premium audio system. Uh, it came with white on white with white wheels, which is pretty much the most 1980s way you could get a car um, outside of, of um, some sort of, uh, how am I forget? I'm forgetting. It's oh, of Miami Vice, dude. Miami Vice, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> okay, I'm, seriously, I couldn't remember it to save my life. So, I mean, uh, I've kind of had to learn a little bit about it after the facts. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, the, the rub on this car when it came out, and I remember it very well was, because I own that car, was that this was a lightweight, kind of nimble, very um, fun to drive sports car, and this was more of a GT, right? It became yeah. more of a, 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 a Grand Tour, a little bit more performance, but more straight line than, than, than curves and then all of a sudden boom Mazda drops this car and people didn't know what to think. Oh that car was a revolution uh, in many many ways so that one's a 1995 RX-7 FD. So this car was a twin turbo setup. So it had a small turbocharger to really kind of kick the car in gear and then a larger turbocharger when it got uh, going. It made about 255 horsepower, which doesn't sound like a huge amount by modern standards. But you have to remember this is a time when this car weighed about 2,800 pounds and your average Toyota Supra was about 3,400 pounds. Your average uh, 3,000 GT was a 3,800 pound car. So when you're looking at this by comparison, it's literally a thousand pounds less than some of its competitors. And it got up and went. It could hit zero to 60 in about 4.9 seconds, topped out over 160 miles an hour. It was really, I know that these numbers sound like, you know, your, your average family sedan these days, apparently, but uh, back in the day, this was quite a sports car and you drive it today and it still drives like something completely special. So uh, the, w this car right here, the orange car, was a PPG pace car for the IndyCar series. Beautiful color. Oh, absolutely. Uh, one of the cool things about this is it has a full roll cage in it, but you'd never know it unless you open the door because of how well integrated it was. Um, this one made about, again, 350 horsepower. So it was significantly more powerful than the production model, but it was, um, but again, it was, it was exclusively used as a pace car. The car right next to it is kind of my next on the countdown list. So in 2002, there was kind of a send off for the RX-7 because it was the end of an era. And in Japan, they ended up creating a, a special model called the Spirit R. Uh, this car right here at one point or another was a US spec model, but there was a giant crate that showed up on the front, uh, the front walkway out here over at R&D and it had all the parts of the paint. Uh, there was a special dashboard for the Spirit R and we figured out that this one had to have been handmade for this because there was never a left hand drive dashboard of, for the Spirit R and uh, it has Kevlar and, and carbon fiber uh, interior elements in it and this right here is the last or is the well, it's the last Spirit R ever made, but it is the only left-hand drive Spirit R. And we feel that we can, we can say that because this car was completely made in this building. It was torn apart. We have a paint booth upstairs. We have engineers who took their time to make this car into a one-of-one one priceless car for this collection. It was, all the parts were gifted to one of our executives as a thank you for all of his hard work and dedication. So let's go to the RX-8. Uh, which is, of course, uh, the last gen 
Mm -hmm. RX. Yeah, this is the last rotary car ever brought into the US, as in not like the last batch. This is the last VIN number brought into the US of a rotary powered car. So the RX-8 was introduced into the US in 2004, or 2004 model year, I believe. Uh, commenters are probably going to critique, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that one, but um, it, it ended up uh, going until the 2011 model year in the US and 2012 production year total. And this is the last one. This one is an LM20, which was a, uh, a graphics package that commemorated the 20th anniversary of our win at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. And it is, um, uh, there are only two of the cars that still have this livery in the world, and this is one of them. And uh, again, as soon as this car was brought off of a, a shipping boat, it was immediately put into this collection. You know, the great thing about Mazdas, of course, is that they're cars that are built to last. And these RX-8s right now, if you go on Craigslist, these are just used cars. You can get them for yeah. thousands, literally. And, yeah. and I would say, if you guys are looking for a classic collectible car, right, that's not yet become uh, out of this world expensive, definitely look at these because right now uh, they're very affordable. Of course, they had some issues. There were some issues with oil uh, in the engines that people talk about, but nevertheless, I mean, uh, that's, that's a good one. Not only that, but it is a fantastic car to learn how to drive fast with. Now that we've seen the last rotary powered car ever brought into the US, how about we see one of the first? Hell yeah, let's go check it out. If it were me doing this list, this would be number one. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> it's, it's such a cool car, man. We just got done with that RX-8, which was literally the last VIN of any rotary car brought into the US. So this is one of the first two. So there was a company, is a company called Curtis Wright. It's an aviation company, and there were about 30 automakers, 30 different companies working on patents for making the rotary viable after, um, after it had gotten, uh, after NSU had started licensing it. And Mazda needed to make the car work because Mazda wanted to stay independent. And the Ministry of Industry and Trade uh, in Japan said automakers need to consolidate unless they have a unique technology. There was always this kind of internal friction issue and they call them the devil's claw marks where the heat and, and the lack of oil distribution would create these claw marks. And Mazda had actually got an NSU engine uh, and experimented on it uh, to make this work for, for it. And within an hour, it failed. And Mazda said, well, we're hedging all of our bets on this technology, and this was 1961. 1964, they had a working prototype of this car that they debuted at the Tokyo Motor Show. And then 1967, which this car is, there were about 300, uh, 300 some odd uh, 1967 Cosmos made, 1967 part 1968 that were short wheelbase like this. There were 1,176 first generation Cosmos made all together. And so this is one of only two that was legally ever brought to the US, uh, imported as officially by Mazda for Curtis Wright to experiment with for aviation. First Japanese car ever to win a major award at a Concours in the US. This one has a first, is a first gen, so has a 110 horsepower engine, has a four speed manual transmission. Uh, I've had the opportunity to drive it. It drives exactly how you would think a 50 year old Miata would except with a rotary engine. For some reason, all these cars were always white. Never, yeah. I've never seen them in any other color but so, white. There were a few that escaped the factory in different colors. Yeah. Most of them were white. And and the, the, the gentleman who led the, the 47 Samurai, the engineers who created this car, uh, just passed away on December 20th, Kenichi Yamamoto. All right, so number five says, car and driver, dude, what are you doing to me? Car and driver. They're okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, well, this car holds a lot of significance to us because it's a, an RX-2, it's a 1973, and car and driver had uh, one of these as their long-term cars. You know, they do their, their 40,000 yeah, sure. mile cars now. Yeah. And they loved it so much that at the time, Mazda still did these, these uh, promotional cars, and, and they ended up donating one to the, the cause that was car and driver. And car and driver ended up stripping the car, turning it into a race car, putting in the IMSA RS, which is radial sedan series. And this was the first Mazda to ever win a professional race, uh, a semi-professional race, because it was entered in the IMSA RS uh, in North America. Uh, this car holds some part uh, particular significance to Mazda because this is the first car that ever 
won a race on U.S. soil for Mazda. Um, our racing series kind of started in Japan as a dealer-led thing where a lot of dealers would take their Capellas and their, their Familias, uh, the, the small, medium-sized cars, and they'd start go race, uh, to go racing with them. That's sort of how it went in North America, too, where racing for Mazda really started at the grassroots level. Right, the one I'm more interested in actually is the RX-7 next to it. Tell me about this guy. Okay, so you can kind of see this as a, the RX-2 had a bit of a rudimentary roll cage in it. This one right here is a 1979 and what makes this cool is this was a backup for the 24 hours of Daytona. Uh, there was a guy named Yoshimi Katayama and he was a factory works driver so he basically took all the, the race cars and all the production cars to our testing facility in Miyoshi which is about an hour outside of Hiroshima in the middle of freaking nowhere but it is a beautiful test facility and he would beat these cars up and he would just make sure they were as durable as durable got. Uh, Mazda ended up dominating at the 24 hours of Daytona in its classes for years and years and years because of the work that Katayama did. Uh, so it is as um, close to anything as you'll see the car that raced there because it is basically the car that raced there. Is it Unos Cosmos? Unos Cosmo. Okay, tell me about this car, because I don't know anything about it. Okay. It's cool. So again, back in the, the bubble era of Japanese cars, Mazda had these uh, aspirations to bring a lot of luxury cars to the US. This was would be, have been one of them. This would have been called the Amati 800 when the Amati brand was about to launch. Uh, Amati never happened. But this car came over to the US as kind of a, an experiment, uh, a beta, if you will, for, for what the, this premium, huge luxury sports car would have been. It has a three rotor twin turbo engine. Uh, it shares a platform with that 929 over there. Makes about 300 horsepower, 300 pound feet of torque. Probably makes more than that in real life. Uh, it was quote unquote limited to 276 in Japan. Uh, it is a rocket. The Yunos Cosmo was actually the first car ever to have an in-dash navigation system. So Mazda has had a whole bunch of innovations that uh, between our engineering and powertrain technologies, obviously three rotor twin turbo, this is the only three rotor production car. Uh, this would have easily been the equivalent of a 60, 70, 80 thousand dollar car in its day. While this car never came to the US, it really was ahead of its time. Uh, this car right here, there were, was a luxury model and a sports model. This one is a little bit of a mishmash of both because this would have been how it probably would have been equipped had it come to the US. You know, we gotta talk about the L car here because I just love this era of Japanese car, right? It was a Corolla, the Civic. Uh, the Mazda GLC. Yep. So Mazda, again, um, it really Got, it got its, its footing with rotary powered cars in the US, but then there was the oil embargo. Within a matter of 18 months after fuel prices had gone up, Mazda needed a really, really efficient alternative uh, because rotaries were great at doing a lot of things, packing a lot of power relative to their small engines, but they weren't necessarily the most efficient thing. The GLC, which actually did stand for great little car, um, and is really kind of the, the early, early predecessor to the Mazda 3 that we all know and love today, was what saved Mazda and put it on the map with this hyper-efficient little hatchback. You, you gotta check out the seats in this thing because they're, they're yellow plaid. Um, <laughs> And, and you'll never see anything like that today in any kind of car. My first car before actually the uh, RX-7 was the Honda Civic CDCC, which was at that time very yeah. similar, right? It was that same kind of era. Yeah, I, uh, you know Davis Adams from yes. over yeah. at uh, that, that company that starts with yes. an H. I have, I, I have challenged him that if he could find one of those, we will have a duel between our 1970s hatchbacks. <laughs> All right, All right, Davis, you heard him. Mazda just threw down the gauntlet. Darn right. Pick it up. Uh, Let's talk about the Miata. We cannot go into the historic collection without a Miata. Okay. Got, uh, red, white, and blue. Tell me about So this. red, white, and blue. So in 1989, when Mazda had made the world introduction of the, uh, the Miata at the Chicago Auto Show, there were three of them. There was a red one, a white one, and a blue one. So what you're looking at right here are VINs 14, 15, and 17. These are the red, white, and blue cars. Uh, 15 is the red one. Uh, I believe 14 is, the, uh, is the, the blue one, and then 17 is the white one. So what makes this one 
so cool is that there is a journalist named Dan Edmonds who ended up getting that this white one almost immediately. This is the first Miata that was ever turned into an SCCA race car. So it was autocrossed, it was rally crossed, believe it or not. So this car spent a good chunk of its life on dirt. Um, Sometime in the early 2000s, he ended up putting the car back together because the engine was in his own personal Miata. And, um, and then it was redonated back to Mazda. And this car holds a lot of significance because the Miata is the most raced car in the world. Uh, there are probably about five to 10,000 of them actively raced every year. Then there's the yellow one over here, which is actually a 1989 one as well. Uh, so at the time, Mazda had known that it was going to want to create this sort of tuner vibe. This car is really why Sunburst Yellow became a production color because of such overwhelming response. This was kind of a wide body. The interior is a little bit different than the production one. They, they took a pre-production car. Some of the, the, the armrests, some of the switch gear on the dashboard are a little bit different than the production car. So 1992, uh, the design team wanted to come up with a hard top. So the, the, uh, the director of design at the time said he wanted three distinct versions of the car. He wanted a, a, a true hard top, he wanted a roadster, and then he wanted a fastback design. And um, while the, uh, uh, kind, of, kind of in the spirit of the old MGBs. And while that never happened, uh, uh, the proposal never made it past the proposal stage. In 1996, he created, uh, they created this um, M Coupe car. And BMW really, really liked the name of the car, so it eventually went to them. But, uh, but the M be story there. Yeah, I, I have no idea what yeah. that story is, but 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 they ended up creating this as a show car and that's all uh, fiberglass and plastic and foam and wood and everything up top for the door. Right, how about the gold one? It's number 500,000. Oh. So there were two 500,000s made. There was, uh, they were identically specced. One's left-hand drive, one's right-hand drive. Japan ended up picking the color for this one. Um, we did not, um, however, um, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's significant in that there are only so many of these. Um, Where's the million one? The millionth Miata is back in Hiroshima. Okay, it's not here. Okay. However, we did get the 700,000th and there's only one 700,000th and that's our Mazda speed right there. This is 700,000? 700,000. So you got 500 and 700,000. Yes. And this is a turbo. Yes, it is. So cool. it's the only turbocharged Miata. Uh, and it made about 178 horsepower. Uh, it was uh, super, super limited. Uh, I believe that there were only about 45,000, 4,500, 5,000 maybe within the two model years. Yeah, I mean, it's cool because a lot of people put turbos on their Miatas, yeah, but this was a factory turbo. Yeah, so it was, it, it's definitely, it was, a, it was a kind of an American-led thought and it ultimately turned out to be one of the most collectible Miatas. Speaking of collectible Miatas though, yeah. This, guy? this one is a 25th anniversary. It is the only third generation or NC that was made in Soul Red. It was kind of a send off. There were only a thousand of them made. A uh, hundred of them were brought to the US uh, with the, the white parchment leather. Uh, all the dashboards are hand painted. No two are exactly alike. And it was a uh, completely loaded end of the line model uh, before the, the fourth generation model uh, came out and debuted and, and really kind of carried the torch forward. All right, um, Jacob, this is number one, but it doesn't look like it's all in one piece, obviously. Why is this number one? Okay. What's, what's special about this car? Because I don't know what this is. Okay, so this is a 1990 uh, 787, and yeah, it's all in pieces, but I felt this was a great number one uh, because it really shows you what a, uh, a, a Group C prototype car looked like in 1990, 1991. So this car ran in 1990, had a little bit of an electrical issue then. Then in 1991, when Mazda won the 24 Hours of Le Mans, uh, this car placed eighth overall. Uh, obviously, it's a stripped down carbon fiber tub. Uh, this one's chassis 002. So there were only three of these, uh, three 787s and then three 787Bs ever made. Uh, and it really holds a lot of significance to our company because it is, I mean, Mazda is the only Japanese automaker that has ever won Le Mans. And you think about that, and if any other Japanese automaker ever does win Le Mans, or any other Asian automaker for that matter, uh, think about the competition of the year. Uh, Jaguar was dominant. 
Porsche was dominant with their 962s. Peugeot was hugely dominant. Mercedes was dominant. Ferrari still was running in, in the top tiers. You had five competitors right there. Any one of them could have won. And, and ultimately, uh, Mazda ended up winning from a matter of endurance. You, you think of, of uh, rotary engines, the more you beat on them, the more they love it. Back in the day, you had diligent engineers. Mazda had been to Le Mans 16 times before it actually won. Where's the winning car? Japan. Winning cars in Japan. In uh, yeah, we have a couple of the sister cars. This is obviously one of the sister cars. Uh, we have a 1989 that is covered in the same green and orange as the winning car from 1991. And that one's a 767B. Uh, but that one has a 630 horsepower four rotor. The car that is in pieces right here, and I'll show you the, uh, the R26B engine, is about a 730 horsepower engine. So it really did have a 100 horsepower bump to kind of get over the, get over the curve. And let's, let's look at the engine. Yeah. So understand what's uh, under the hood of our old RX-7. You see one, two, three, four rotor. That is the, the casing for a four rotor engine. Yep. So you think about it, and this engine is tiny, tiny for a naturally aspirated, 750 horsepower engine and these are the four rotors that sit in that engine again the engine is being completely rebuilt uh randy has everything very very meticulously organized where these lobes are almost identical to what you'd find in in your rx7 so so a traditional just so people understand a traditional piston car would have pistons and of course you've got combustion which pushes the piston down the one across from it goes up mm -hmm. and, you know boom 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 which is attached with crankshaft uh, i'm sorry which is attached with yeah crankshaft, which then of course turns the the uh, wheels this on the other hand is a rotor which lives inside the casing right there and instead of making pistons go up and down the explosion makes the rotor go around yes yeah i'd say that the it, it's sort of uh would be comparable to like an electric car in that it's yeah. ultra smooth and you just have this rush of power it's it's addictive As you guys know, we always love to do a bonus, and what's better than a rotary-powered Suzuki? Suzuki. I have known nothing about this, so tell me about this. So uh, I know next to nothing about it, so we're almost in the same boat here. <laughs> uh, what it is is Mazda actually helped Suzuki with a rotary engine motorcycle called the RE5, and uh, ours is one of a handful that I, I still know of that exists. Uh, this actually was called, uh, I believe it was, uh, I, it looks sort of like the, the, a canister a St. Bernard would wear, uh, you know, up, uh, on rescue missions. I believe that it, it was called like a buffalo tank or something. <laughs> but um, it's really a cool motorcycle. Uh, it had a, a two rotor in it, and it's it, it it didn't. I think it was made for like maybe a handful of model years, one or two model years. And we have one in the collection because it really was partially a Mazda project that ended up uh, making sure that this saw production. You know, one of the things that I'm noticing on this motorcycle is just how much like cladding there is in, on the exhaust. Because one of the things obviously rotaries do is they run super hot. Oh yeah. And so the exhaust gets super hot. So I think over here on the front of it, there's a little bit of like a intake. You see it on the front of the exhaust? Yeah. yeah it's a, the it sucks in air. And then of course there's cladding on the outside of the muffler to keep you from burning your feet or your legs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on the on the the RX-7s down there that we just saw, uh, there there's actually a button that you can press that it's basically a heat dump if the engine starts getting super hot. So, it's it's cool stuff. I mean, that is one of the things with rotary engines. Look, look at the size of the radiator. Right? Yeah, it's, it's a huge, huge radiator. Huge. huge radiator. This might be a good place to point out this little flag, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of cool. There's a gentleman named Jim Meter, and he owned a company called Racing Beat. And Racing Beat still exists out here in Anaheim, and you'll see it all over the, the white car next to it. And they were a rotary performance tuner, and are a rotary performance tuner. And their goal was to make these engines as powerful as humanly possible. And they, they succeeded. They did a really great job. Mazda's had a great relationship with Racing Beat. And uh, they, they ended up doing some of the exhaust work. If you remember the Furai concept, they actually did the exhaust on the, the Furai. Uh, I believe that car had a 13J, which is the same engine as that, that 767. So it made about 500 horsepower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah.
All right, dude. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to actually show our viewers around. This yeah. has been, uh, you know, like I say, a love letter to all you Mazda fans. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, the question now, of course, is what will Dave think of our RX-7? I think Dave's going to love it. Now, if you've, Dave basically grew up in an RX-7 at some point right. or another, so I think he is absolutely going to be in love with your car. So. Cool. Good luck on the sale. Yeah, we're going to find out next. And then uh, I've got two guys actually already coming to look at it. Yeah, I, It's going to be one of the cars that's going to hurt to sell. Oh, right? I bet. that is, It's a beautiful car. And I, the interior looks like it's brand new. So I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for you. And I'm rooting for you to get top dollar because you deserve it on that one. I don't know where you found it. But whatever, it, it's an amazing looking car. I'm the guy responsible for everything good about Mazda. <laughs> and nothing, <laughs> yeah. that, nothing bad. Remember how small mirrors used oh, to be? Oh, they're tiny. I know. Yeah. So what do you say, Tommy? Shall we uh, open the hood and swap out the uh, spark plugs? See if that changes that a little around a little bit? Yeah, let's do it. The first car I ever bought when I was 16, half 17 years old was an RX-7. Yeah.